Welcome back, Eric Rexted, talking to you about distance sampling. In my previous lecture, I described the detection function and talked about its centrality in the estimation of population size using distance sampling methods. I'm going to show you two related methods or two related concepts that you're welcome to use if they make the idea of distance sampling and the algebra under it more clear to you. To review, I'll remind you of the detection function g of x defined as the probability of detecting an animal conditional upon the fact that the animal is at distance x from the transect. We talked about the detection function carrying along with it the assumption that the probability of detecting an animal given that it is at distance zero from the line, namely on the line, is equal to one. This introduced the concept of p hat sub a that was calculated as the area under the detection function curve. That ratio, the ratio of that to the area under the rectangle, if there was no decrease in detectability as a function of size. And I showed you how to calculate the area under the curve by using the integral and the calculation of the area under the rectangle is calculated simply as the base length w times the height 1 because we've defined the height to be 1. So that's how we use the detection function to help us estimate the probability of detecting animals and thereby adjusting the number that we see for this detectability. An alternative way of thinking about estimating abundance using distance sampling is the concept of the effective half width of your transect strip. There's a piece of notation called mu that gets used here. So the geometry of this leads to the idea that instead of having a transect where we detect animals out to W and miss some piece of A. Instead, convert your thinking to that of a strip transect in which detectability is perfect and we miss nothing out to this distance mu. So let's see if a little figure can help the process along. There's going to be, a, there's going to be an animation here in a second. So what I've defined now, I've taken the same histogram that I had previously, and I've fitted, I've passed a detection function through it in a red line. In addition to that, I've now placed a vertical line at this distance, mu, away from my transect. And so I'm defining this quantity mu as the distance out to which we could think of our detection, prob detection probability being perfect. How is that possible? Well, the idea is that we're going to see some animals at distances beyond mu, and those are the, no those are the ones that have been highlighted here by this dotted red line. Watch this animation closely. What we're doing is we're transforming those animals seen beyond mu to compensate for animals that we missed at distances less than mu. And so this value mu that goes by the acronym effective strip width is this distance at which we see as many animals beyond mu as we missed inside of mu. All right. 
So that allows us to convert this equation that you've seen previously that allows us to estimate abundance given the number that we see, little n, the size of our study area, and the size of our covered area multiplied by this quantity p sub a that adjusted for imperfect detectability. We can now think about that as if we had a strip transect out to this distance mu. And so our denominator now becomes the product of p sub a multiplied by w is now equivalent to this quantity mu that is estimated, mu hat. So that's the area effectively covered by our sampling is 2 mu hat times L. So that allows us to estimate abundance. So if we could estimate this quantity mu hat, that allows us to estimate the quantity n hat. And so we're re reminded that P sub A was this area under the curve divided by the area under the rectangle. I'm now asking you to recognize that mu hat is equal to this area under the curve, the integral of our detection function g of x between 0 and w. Our third and final way of thinking about the detectability process and how that allows us to estimate population size introduces yet a third quantity this one is now known as the probability density function. And instead of the letter g denoting it as the detection function did, we're now going to use the letter f. And f is going to stand for this probability density function. Let's see how it works. The definition of the probability density function is the probability of observing an animal in some interval between 0 and w, given that it was observed someplace between 0 and w. So if I tell you I saw an animal in my strip somewhere between 0 and w, if you were armed with this probability density function f of x, you could then calculate what the probability was that that animal was between 1 and 2 meters or 2 and 4 meters or 6 and 8 meters, perhaps. So that is this quantity of probability density function. Previously, we wanted to calculate the area under the detection function curve. Well, we're still interested in that area under the curve, but now we're interested in the area under the probability density function, f of x. It turns out that the area under the probability density function, f of x, is defined to be one. So we know by assumption that the area under this red curve, when the red curve represents a probability density function, must be equal to 1. Because we, know, we already know that we've seen animals somewhere between 0 and w. And so something called the law of total probability tells us that it must be between, somewhere between 0 and w. So we now have a new integral. The integral between 0 and w of f of x is defined to be 1. All right. We have to rescale our histogram bars to, to fit with that assumption that the PDF integrates to 1. But it becomes a very handy way to estimate the things of interest to us in distance sampling by using this f of x approach. Up until now, I've only talked to you about line transect sampling, but there's a, there's a variation of that that's called point transect sampling. And f of x is very handy when it comes to using 
point transects, as we'll see in a moment. So I've showed you these two figures that says the distribution of animals with respect to our transects is uniform. Animals are just as likely to be between 6 and 8 meters from our transects, assuming that they're placed randomly and we have enough of them, as there are animals between 0 and 2 meters from our transects. So the distribution of animals is uniform. But what we're interested in is the distribution of the detections, the distribution of the sightings, if you will. And the distribution of the sightings is dictated by these two things, two processes. Where are the animals filtered by? Where do we, how do we see animals? Well, we see animals close to us perfectly, but we see animals far away from our transect imperfectly. And so remind, remember, this was our function g of x that says probability of detection fades given the distance of these animals from the transect line. So it's the product of those two processes that give rise to the distribution of the sightings that we make. All right. That all fits together quite nicely when you're doing line transect sampling. For point transect sampling, for reasons I won't go into great detail at the moment, the process is a little bit different. For point transects, the distribution of animals at varying distances from the line is actually an increasing function. It increases linearly. The short reason for that is that there is more area in rings at various distances away from the point at which you're standing. And so, given that the area is higher, but the density of animals is uniform, then there are more animals in the ring between 10 and 11 meters away from you than there are animals at, in the circle at distance 0 to 1 meter away from you. The detection process is still the same. Your observers have more difficulty detecting animals at great distances from the point than they do at detecting animals close to the point. So now the filtering of where do the animals reside, filtered by this detection process, gives rise to a very differently shaped curve. And that's what you will see if you were actually looking at point transect data. The histogram of point transect data takes on this shape in its probability density function as opposed to this shape when you're doing line transect sampling. I just want to motivate for a moment the fact that using this concept of the probability density function gives us another way to estimate this quantity piece of A. Statisticians have been interested in probability density functions for centuries. And as a result, they have quite a few ways of trying to go about estimating the shape of those probability density functions. And the software that you'll use, Program Distance, has built into it some of that machinery for estimating the shape of detection detection functions or probability density functions. All right. If this red line is now the PDF, the probability density function, we can still estimate piece of A as the area under the curve divided by the area under the rectangle. But now we can express each of those quantities somewhat differently. The area under the curve is now equal to 1 because that is a feature that probability density functions have. Their area, the area under them, is equal to 1 by definition. Now how do we calculate the area under the rectangle with this piece of geometry? Well, the length of the base is still the distance from 0 to w, namely w, 
but now the height is described as f of 0. So this height, f of 0, is what we use now in this denominator to estimate the area of the rectangle. If I substitute this expression for p sub a into our previous expression that allows it, allowed us to estimate n, we end up with this equation. That equation can be simplified to this quantity. And notice what happens in this simplification. The w's, the strip width, cancel. I'll save this question. I'll let you think about it for a minute. We'll return to that subject in a moment. So, I've now showed you three different geometrical interpretations, and those geometric interpretations are accompanied by three different sets of formulae that allow us to estimate either population size or population density using these three different philosophical approaches to line transects. So this is the approach useful to you if you've come from a mark recapture background and are comfortable with the idea of probabilities of detection, P sub A. This was the first formula I introduced to you. The second formulation introduces the concept of mu, the effective strip width, and the relationship between mu and p sub a was depicted this way. We can insert those, that transformation into our previous equations and come up with these two equations that describe the way we would estimate abundance or density if we had estimated effective strip width in contrast to estimating p sub a. The third and final way of coming at the problem of abundance estimation was to use the probability density function f of x, specifically the value that f of x takes on at distance 0. So we'll find f of 0 to be a central character in our understanding of the estimation of population size once we recognize this inverse relationship between f of 0 and mu. We can then insert that substitution into our equations and come up with these fairly simple equations that allow us to estimate population size or density if we've estimated the probability density function and evaluated that probability density function at distance 0. Back to the biology for a moment, I've got a slide here on when to use specific methods that we've now talked about. We've talked about strip transects, where detectability is assumed to be perfect out to some distance w, line transects, where we don't assume perfect detectability, and point transects, where the observer remains stationary as opposed to moving. Strip transects are useful when you have animals that are in big groups, and those groups might be loosely organized. Strip transects are also good for studying things that don't move, like plants, or things that occur at high density, or things that are easy to see, easy to detect. Line transects come into their own when we work with animals that are sparsely distributed. They don't occur at high densities. They're spread out across large regions and we need to be efficient in our data collection. Line transects are also useful when we have animals that occur in clusters, but when those clusters are easy to define. Schools of dolphins, schools of fish. Line transects are also commonly applied when the animals that we're investigating flee when we approach them. And it's that 
fleeing or flushing movement by things like grouse and hares that allow us to record their detections. Point transects are best used when populations occur at high densities and when you are trying to collect data on a number of species simultaneously. And so multi-species surveys for things like songbirds where you not only have to detect their distances but you also have to classify the individuals by species. In patchy habitats, non-contiguous habitats, it's easier to place sampling effort with points than it is with lines. And it's also useful to use point transect methods when it's difficult for your observers to both move through the habitats and record data at the same time. If it's difficult to do both, well then why not make it easy on them, allow the observers to remain stationary while they're collecting data. So we, to conclude this section of lecture, I want you to recognize that we have lots of different pieces of notation that I've introduced you to, and those pieces of notation can be broken into two categories. The first category are things that we either know or things that we observe. Okay, things like how many lines did we walk? What was the length of the lines that we walked? How many things did we detect? What's the size of our study area? All of those things are known to us or can be collected by us. And you'll see these pieces of notation when you use the distance sampling software. The second category of items are the things that we want to know from the data that we collect. So these things are unknown to us, but we estimate them in the process of producing estimates of abundance or estimates of density. We can think about abundance of groups or clusters or herds or schools, and then the conversion of those schools or clusters into abundances or densities of individuals. I've introduced you to these functions and eventually we'll get on to the subject of trying to estimate the size of clusters.